Peacock's tail made Charles Darwin sick. That's what he said. The peacock's tail makes me sick. Why? He couldn't explain it by natural selection. It didn't seem like an adaptive result in evolution. It wasn't useful. It wasn't practical. How could evolution produce this excessive, beautiful profusion of feathers, this giant display? It just wasn't that practical. It may not be useful. It may not be adaptive. It may not be practical. It's just beautiful. And so you have another side of evolution, not just survival of the fittest, but also survival of the beautiful. And what the book does is traces the story of why it is that biology has not really studied this phenomenon too much. It's almost, almost as if it's embarrassing to science that nature just produces these wild, beautiful things that aren't so useful. The book begins with, with the, me coming upon a... a, a, a an artwork made by a bird, you know, that I was astonished to learn in Australia, wandering through the forest, I see this sculpture made of little thatched pieces of grass and decorated with blue plastic spoons. What? Turns out the satin bower bird always decorates its bowers with blue. If they can't find blue flowers, they use blue plastic. Vogelkopf's bower bird builds this elaborate tent-like structure, decorates it with red berries, black berries, green berries, and a bunch of petals of a flower in yellow, very carefully arranged. And these things are not nests, they're artworks made by the male bower birds to attract females, but they spend months working on these artworks. And this is the one example we know of in nature where an animal has evolved the need to make art. And each species has its own aesthetic, makes a different shaped bower, a different pattern. And evolution, somewhere in, in the fringes, somewhere in the edges of possibility, has required the need for art to be made. And this is just remarkable, and that's how I got interested in this whole aesthetic side of things. Well, my book, in a way, differs from some other recent accounts Dennis Dutton's book, The Art Instinct, and Richard Dawkins' many works. These guys have a more adaptive view. Anything we see that evolution produces is adaptive. It has a purpose. It's solving a problem. And I see that nature produces a lot of things that, you know, could have gone a whole different way. Evolution tries out possibilities. Often it's very practical. You have most animals and plants adapted to their niches in a particular way. But the, the ornament, the beauty, the flourish is often you know, a mixture of the basic forms of nature with arbitrary whim. What happened to happen? What happened to catch on? What kinds of aesthetics were actually preferred by the females? What happened to go, if you roll back evolution a few million years and start it again, you're going to get totally different species. We don't have the world that had to occur. We have one possibility out of many, which makes nature much more beautiful, kind of capricious, kind of surprising and, and really fascinating in a new kind of way that I think makes us, can make us appreciate it even more than ever before. Yeah, this book is definitely for the general readers, for anyone who likes to read cool stories about the natural world and how people have tried to make sense of it. You'll learn about how artists invented camouflage that became very important to the military. You'll learn how s some artists have helped scientists by visualizing how proteins fold together in ways that mathematics and, and uh, in equations couldn't quite figure out without creative playing around and exploring. And you'll just get a sense, you'll, you'll end up with a sense that nature is a much more valuable part of life, part of experience, simply because it is so beautiful. Not just because we think it is, because it's part of its very essence, part of evolution itself.